From the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, it's Retro Nerd Girl with a film review for you. Today, I'll be reviewing the movie Fantastic Planet, released in 1973. Starring Barry Boswick, Jennifer Drake, and Eric Boggan. Directed by Rene Laloux. The synopsis is, Aliens from another planet by the name of Drags have captured humans from planet Earth and taken them to planet Gam. The Drags use humans as pets and pawns for their amusement. Among the humans in captivity is Tyr, who the Drags unknowingly arms with the knowledge to free his oppressed people. Now before I go on with the review, I'm sorry if there are mispronunciations in this video. I am trying my best to pronounce the words as I've researched them, but uh, I will be prone to mistakes. <laughs> so let's go on to the story. This film is an adaptation of a novel, Ohms in Siri, if translated Ohms linked together by Pierre Perrault, under the pseudonym Stéphane Wool, published in 1957. The word Holmes is actually a play on the French word Homes, or Holmes, which means men. So the title is more like men linked together. And if you read the book or you've seen the film, you understand that the meaning is actually something like men coming together in revolution. And I find that to be quite clever. It's within the genre of dystopian French sci-fi novels, exploring alternative worlds such as The Champ of the Saints, published in 1973, and Monkey Planet, aka Planet of the Apes, by Pierre Boulet in 1963. Two artist filmmakers, Roland Topor, and Rene Laloux collaborated on many animated films together, such as Dead Time, released in 1964, and The Snails, released in 1965. They got together in the late 1960s to make Homs and Seri a feature animated film. Much of the story from the book and the film are closely similar except for when it came to the ending. However, many of the main themes of oppression and revolution still remained. The team determined that they would share this production with a studio in Prague in 1967 until tragically in August 1968, the Soviet Union and other members of the Warsaw Pact invaded Czechoslovakia. The production was then halted until 1969. The story was affected by the animation because one of the features of Czech animation styles is to use characters as symbols that represent ideas and I think that lent to the artsy interpretation of what's going on on screen. I think it enriched the film. And I really enjoyed the telling of this tale and the way that it was told, showing us a lot of the scenes without much dialogue. What dialogue we get is very potent and getting to the point and filling the mind with intrigue about what's happening and why. Now the pacing. At an hour and 12 minutes, it's very short and sweet. It feels a lot longer than it is though. And that's mainly because the adventure spans the lifetime of a single character and his journey. The challenge in the film is beautifully set up right in the very beginning, where we see a woman with a newborn child in her arms being chased, teased, grabbed, and tortured until ultimately she dies at the hands of giant blue children. And those blue giants are called the drags. It's a strange feeling when you see this horrible thing happen and we instantly know that the drags are the perceived evil in the story. 
it becomes apparent that the drags are to represent real world humans. When we discover that the children just view the ohms as wild animals and their actions are no different than what human children might do to a bunny or a bug in their backyard. There's a deadly innocence about it. They only wanted to play with the ohm, not kill it. The drags regard the ohms as cute pets, but generations after generations of ohms have proved to be unmanageable because although their lifespans are shorter, they breed at an alarming rate that the drags cannot control. And many ohms escape captivity to live in the wild and become pests. Every three cycles, they de-ohm the parks and wild areas with a variety of mass killing devices. However, by the next three cycles, the populations of ohms are overrun again. So who's the bad guy here? Is it the pesky little ohms that make adorable pets when domesticated? Or is it the drags that are protecting their homes from being overrun, stealing their food and disturbing the peace? As we get deeper into the story, the drags not only represent humans in our real world, but society's elite. The empathy. The empathy is a little strange because seeing the film the way it's set up, there's a feeling of detachment to the characters, but you do get an idea for what the filmmakers want us to understand about this world. They want us to side with the ohms, being that they're actually humans in this story. The ohms represent any oppressed group of people, animals, and, or even insects. Essentially, any form of life we feel more important than. And I believe that was absolutely brilliant. A drag master and his daughter, Tiwa, adopt Tyr as a pet. They believe that they are providing him with food, shelter, and their version of love, or what they can possibly give to a lesser species. However, in captivity, Tyr must endure humiliating costumes, pit fights with neighboring domestic ohms, the whims of his owner, and of all things, he must always be obedient. Right away, we can see that Tyr is instinctively rebellious, and this is admirable as we see him use every opportunity he gets to push back at his oppressors. By what looks like a defect in Tyr's obedience collar, he learns about drag history through an education headset that Tiwa is learning with. One day, Tyr seizes his opportunity to escape into the wild while also stealing Tiwa's headphones. He finds ohms out in the wild and educates them with the headset. By the end, the empathy really ramps up as we see how rough the lives are of the ohms when they are left to their own devices in the wild because they are constantly under attack by larger animals. They seek stability because on the savage level of just living to survive, they're not really living at their full potential. Now the technical aspects. Upon looking at the film, the most noticeable part of the animation is how unique it is. The animation itself looks like moving art, and it is. The movement is very simplistic, created from stop-motion cutouts and fades to create the illusion. It was balanced with detail, shading within the drawings. Roland Topper's cross-hatch drawing technique lent a special warmth to the visuals, a depth and charm as well. His production design applied his signature surrealism on Showcase. The creativity of building the wonders of the world of GAM screams to the audience that this is not planet Earth. And that is exactly what I was looking for. This beautiful, strange world is geared in a psychedelic feast of oddities in a magical visual tapestry. 
One of my favorite scenes is the drag grandmaster's meditation scene, displaying an incredible spectacle of colors, shapes to describe the amazing things that the drags could do through meditation. The film's score was composed by Alan Gorger, who captured the wonderment of Gam as a mysterious place full of whimsy, danger, and surprises. You can hear all of this from the music. It's a huge part of the experience. Now the performances. The performances are kind of tricky because the animation really gives so little for facial expressions. And the voice acting is most often monotone. Every once in a while we may be privy to some emotional inflection, but it's very, very scarce. Now my wish list. I really wish that our society was more accepting of the lack of clothing featured in the movie. I know it's a controversial thing, but I find it less of an issue with the movie and more of an issue with our environment. It's one of the reasons why the film really never got the exposure I feel it should have. I actually didn't think it was gratuitous nudity, but I thought it seemed pretty natural. And it suits the environment. The ending. The ending was satisfying enough not to disappoint, but I felt it was so rushed with exposition to tell us that some kind of peace was achieved between the drags and ohms. Because of the challenges in the production, it isn't hard to imagine that the film may have run out of money and possibly even time. But an extra five minutes could have been so great to polish off the visual story. My enjoyment. When the film debuted in 1973, it was a critical success. It won the special prize at the 1973 Cannes Film Festival and later it was included among the 1001 movies you must see before you die edited by Steven Schneider. In 2016, Fantastic Planet was ranked the 36th greatest animated movie ever by Rolling Stone. I happened to only find out about this film about two years ago and it took a while for me to actually get to see it on video. But I was not disappointed as the film unfolded for me. I was thoroughly entertained and amazed at this sort of antique style of animation with wild untamed imagination and you know I was really blown away by it and I was locked in for the roller coaster ride of visual ecstasy. One of the critiques of the movie is that it doesn't really have a story and I think it does. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. It tells the story on a broader, more epic scale. It's about how the ohms linked together and overcame their oppressors to live in peace. I absolutely love and recommend this film. It's, it's now one of my favorites. My rating is a 9.0. Well, that sums up my review. I hope you liked it. And if you did, I've got almost a hundred of these. So go on and browse the channel and see more reviews from me like this. Subscribe if you haven't done so already and hit the bell icon to be the first to be notified of my next video. This is Retro Nerd Girl signing off. Take care, movie lovers. I'm off to my next review.